Maybe we'll have a look out and update you if we get visual. It's never over. What we saw just in the last week, you know, the movement of those two lionesses, it's like new discoveries. We didn't know they did that. For the past uh, week, we've been we've spent in the Huane Breva system, uh, where we have been following the respective prides of the Huane Breva system. Uh, first, we started with the for the the main pride of the Huane, which is staying more to the east of the river. Uh, where we had a male, uh, two lionesses and then two cubs where we got to spend about four days with them where we, we've picked up uh, incredible information about their behaviour you know how inquisitive some of the young ones were to come over to the vehicle and all that uh, getting to really know and understand how they really do behave as well The idea was for us to get to call out one of the females um, so that we can replace the collars with a GPS satellite early warning system collars. Um, and then one of the, on the fourth night, we got her, got together with Dr. Flipstander and then we set out bait and then we waited there for the lioness, uh, for the lions to come closer so that we can get to dart one of them. Um, but um, it so happened that it was a bit of a mission that specific night that we were, well, we were out there that even um, Dr. Flepstander said that it's, um, it's not a normal occurrence for him or normal experience for him since he's been spending for the past 20 plus years in this area working with the desert adapted lions. Um, but um, an interesting thing played out that night whereby um, the male first came through and he got half of the bait and then he went off and he was busy feeding and then left a little half for the, the lionesses and then they came through, they tried to share a little bit of that but it so happened that um, something went wrong right down there that the two of them got down at each other, a very vicious fight they had. And then from there they moved on um, and an interesting behavior that we also picked up earlier on in the day before the setting up the bait and all that was that um, we were tracking uh, the, 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 the pride of the Huanip and we got into a valley where we got hold of them but um, once we got sight of them they started to run off. So it was a thing that was pretty much um, what, what Dr. Flip was talking about is that whenever they are within the main river system closer to the camps they are a lot more relaxed and they, they associate themselves with the safety that comes from around there as well. But the moment they move away from there they start to you know get flashbacks of the previous experiences that they've been going through within the area where they are one, a, a year and a half old cubs were also shot at an well, at, at a time whereby the farmers were facing also difficulties and they pushed their cows into the river system and then they were sharing the same food source or same river system ecosystem with the lions as well because lions do not know that the, lion, the cow belongs to somebody else but it just sees it as a wild animal as well. So that's how they went for them and then they, that's where how the three cubs were lost the pre of the previous litter as well. Uh, so from there uh, we Basically, under the instruction of Dr. Flip, we come somehow called off that baiting and trying to redart, uh, dart and recolor the lioness. And we just let them go off into the mountain so that we don't really aggravate any other behavior from them. Uh, so from there, we focused our attention on the floodplain sprite. Whereas um, the orphans, the three orphans from the XPL 55, which were one of them called Charlie, was staying with um, XPL 69, which is her aunt. So her aunt passed away a couple of months ago, but since then, um, Charlie has been looking around for her aunt, trying to reconnect because she is, that's the only uh, lioness with whom she had a 
good contact or communication or, or coalition that she has formed over the time that she's been moving around here and they were very successful in in them being two um, two of the floodplains prides because the floodplains pride had to break into two parts as well whereas Alpha and Bravo, the two sisters of Charlie, had moved off towards the dune fields and into the dune fields they started to hunt on Comorans by the Awasa Springs and then from the Awasa Springs they ventured westwards and then they made contact with the ocean and then that's where they were preying on the seals, more Comorans and some beached whales and so on. That's what they were, marine diet that they were basically having. So they've really found an alternative food source at the coastline. Uh, which deters them from any human wildlife conflict as well. Same as for Charlie herself as well. But now currently we we spend two, three days with um, Alpha and Bravo. But uh, we also tried to look for Charlie as well. We covered more extensive scanning, um, tracking and all that, that we've done in the area, but we couldn't find uh, any tracks of Charlie herself. So after the sighting, the last sighting that we had for that day for Alpha and Bravo, they decided they're moving off into the gravel plains to do the south. And um, yesterday morning we picked up um, tracks heading in that direction. And so we thought that maybe Charlie could have called what is maybe in that area. And then she tried to communicate with the two of them so that they can reconnect and then re-establish their collision that they've got as well. But unfortunately, Charlie didn't make contact with them and we just came um, I had a sighting of, of, of Alpha and Bravo, which was an incredible sighting in an in in an in a setup, or should I say, in a scene in which you don't normally see desert adapted lions as well. So it was pretty much awesome to have them out there to really get to experience the diverse um, sceneries within which they are also moving around as well. It's been two weeks of visiting different areas where an ordinary Namibian doesn't have the opportunity to see but sort of getting the inside of how you do your job and the areas that you cover, the distances that you cover, the terrain in which you go through as well, the challenges that you face. Like yesterday morning we had to come and rescue you after getting stuck and so on and these are the insights that we get to mm. get from you and it's, um, it's indeed a humbling experience for all of us to really get to meet you and get to work with you and then yeah it's uh, and discover more parts about Namibia as well. Yeah Alpha I, I, I think in the end I, I think it's an absolute privilege to be able to, to, to live here and, and, and work here. I mean it comes with some sacrifices um, and compromises but it, I, do, I do see it as, a, as an absolute privilege. I think back of when I started as a very young you know, inexperienced person working in Itosha, um, you know, at age of 18 or 19. Um, and I remember being involved and working with all the old experienced rangers of that time, you know, the likes of Chris Eyre and Garth Owen Smith. And I mean, there were many really sort of significant individuals, Rudy Luti, people that really sort of taught us the basics of, of uh, the ecosystems and the, and the, the the wildlife in the area, and I I still remember so clearly um, being given a job uh, to work on the lions and the spotted hyenas and the carnivores, and uh, and I took that quite seriously at that time, and I'm still trying to find the answers to the questions that we had in the early 80s. Um, and, I, and that, I think, uh, where it comes down to the importance of a long term, the investment. The investment that one makes really only pays off in years to come. So um, I feel like I'm, at the moment, I'm probably the only one of that group of people left, but I'm still trying to do the job that they asked me to do yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 30 years ago. <clears throat> So yeah, it is a privilege to be, uh, but uh, you know, the importance of, of that long-term investment. Um, and for us to, to understand the system and to try and manage it, you know, we really need to put in the hard yards. And I think that's sort of what we are, <laughs> are still trying to do. So yeah, I know it's, it's been a privilege to be here. Uh, indeed, indeed. And a privilege for me to get to meet you and work with you as well. Yeah, look, Alpha, I mean, we've, we've worked together some years now. And, uh, and, and again, that, that to me is an example of that investment. You know, you worked here as a, as a tour guide. You saw, you know, the orphans, probably the first person to see them. 
and now you're still here and they grow and I mean so we build on on our knowledge and we build on our perception and understanding and our passion for the area so you know that's that's really a good thing thank you very much thank yeah. you it was uh, it was a great time to to share that with you and um, yeah, I do hope that uh, what we've learned that we can show uh, the world and and, uh, and and the support for the area. I think it's been a brilliant, very nice time and um, it's a privilege to be part of that. Thank you. Although we haven't managed to get hold of Charlie herself, but it doesn't stop here. The search for Charlie still continues. As once we are out of here, Dr. Flip will still continue the remarkable work that he's doing together with all the other partners that he has got and then we will try to get hold of Charlie and then put a GPS satellite early warning system caller on her so that we can at least monitor her movement and understand where and why and how she's busy moving around as well. <laughs>